I just came back to uh, to the country where I'm usually stationed at after five lovely days over in, I don't know what's the correct thing to say here, Catalonian or Spanish, Barcelona, <laughs> mm. obviously Catalonian, man, like, <laughs> I still do not, cannot believe that, like, it is not a separate independent republic, because if you actually visit Barcelona, mm. which, by the way, literally, unequivocally, I've been to, I don't know, 50, 60 cities in my life, arguably the 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 best place i've i've ever seen it's wow. so good that i wouldn't live there because it's so good like it's too good <laughs> it's annoying me like it's it's like mm. why is everything clean and why are people nice and like why is literally mm. the worst <laughs> thing in the city the tourists which i am a part of <laughs> uh but uh no that uh, that aside well whenever you're walking around through uh through the city the number of catalonian flags in every fucking corner the, the, even even the police i don't know if maybe it was because it was like their their big like Saint George's Day, which by the way they celebrate as uh, in a more similar manner to how we celebrate Saint Valentine's Day. I mean, how you Catholics celebrate Saint Valentine's Day because our Orthodox people mm. don't celebrate Saint Valentine's Day because we're like, <laughs> oh, it's a Catholic thing, so we do like a, a day when we go mm. and like we make wine, but they ignore that. So it's uh, I don't know if it was because of that celebration or not, but every fucking street corner had a Catalan flag, and even the cops. Even the cops, like the flag that they would mm. wear on their sleeve, was like uh, of the of the you know the the Catalan one. Huh. So so like it's 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 very like I only saw a Spanish flag three times maybe in the entire city, and it was in like a very official buildings, and it was like squeezed in between like mm. the city flag, a Catalan flag, a European Union flag, and then you know somewhere in the in the middle is like a half uh, half present Spanish flag and shit. Uh, and even when I went to the National Art Museum, which by the way was absolutely incredible the the rhetoric there when it comes to the representation of uh, obviously the the insanely fucked up shit the fascists did to the to the republican mm. and anarchist uh, revolutionaries uh, is very much put on display and very like directly you know is is uh, told through quote unquote a side choosy uh, type of way so every street corner had like fucking uh, anti fascist uh, feminist anti trans action and shit stickers anti -trans on it action. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anti-trans, anti-transphobia <laughs> action. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> like the uh, tur turf, uh, turf anarchist socialist <laughs> from Catalonia. Uh, but uh, no, like it, it, it just felt like a very, very progressive city. But I guess cool. that led me, led me to thinking like the, the, I, the when you're a tourist there, you tourist there, you genuinely feel like a, like a part of the part of the problem. And they kind of tell it to you directly or indirectly. You know, you mm -hmm. speak to them in English and they. Have absolutely understand you and they just like look you straight in the eye and just reply in Catalan or, or Spanish but you know <laughs> I am not uh, I'm not monkey headed and uh, as all Eastern Europeans know I grew up on a, a big enough dose of you know South American soap operas and shit to understand a bit of Spanish at mm. least or, or Catalan you know don't shoot me Jesus Christ now I'm really like threading <laughs> on like thin ice uh, but, uh, but no sorry about the rant but yeah Barcelona for anyone who can afford to uh, please do consider are visiting or again thin ice don't because the, the Barcelonians are constantly like fuck the tourists they're ruining our city <laughs> so I don't know what to say like go or don't but you have a very very beautiful city and what seems like a very class conscious uh class conscious population as well as the, the some of the greatest architecture and art that I've ever fucking seen Gaudi is man that guy's brain was absolutely incredible which and I will finish about my trip to fucking Barcelona with this I actually did the tourist thing which is you know when you're walking down big boulevards but in this case like it wasn't a big boulevard and you know those great artists that uh, you know uh, pretend to be a statue right uh-huh uh-huh and I unironically, I was like in uh, one of that Gaudi's park. I can't remember what it was called. You know, I'm looking at how everything was created and everything is beautiful and integrated with nature and so on. Something one would think like a e eco-socialist future aesthetic could potentially look like. Uh, and I'm walking and I'm like, finally, there's an actual statue of Gaudi, like at one point in the <laughs> park. And I go and I'm like, oh, finally, there's a fucking statue. And this guy just moves his neck a bit to the left and I realize it's an mm -hmm. actual human being and there was like 150 <laughs> tourists around me i literally went oh 
you know, like, that, like, you, you have never been laughed at by like 50 plus people at the same time. Oh. It is not a, except obviously on this podcast, but yeah. it is not a pretty sight to behold. And my mother, my mother, the person who gave life to me was set, standing and cringing right next to me. No, oh. she, was, she even went, he felt apologetic. He like took a, took a photo with us or whatever. Obviously I gave him some money, but uh, yeah, I embarrassed myself. Uh, I loved it and probably contributed to uh, touristic exploitation of the Catalan people. I don't fucking know. But yeah, Barcelona, big, big, big thumbs up. And now I come back to my fucking country and apparently some some crazy drunk lady uh, broke the windows of like five cars that were parked in front of the building. And now I have to fix mm. my car window because uh, <laughs> I guess that's a thing home. that I need to <laughs> Welcome home. This was a perfect walk. There you go. Oh. Specifically, anti yeah. action is what, I, what took place there. And I was going to say, you may have had a bad day, but you didn't have as bad of a day as uh, a patient that I read the uh, notes of oh, recently, no. which uh, they can't, they had come in for something fairly serious this time. But uh, I looked through their notes and it said, I think maybe like in 2012 or something like that, uh, they had come in because, and I shit you not, they had, uh, what's it called, a pinky toe pain. Uh -huh. And I was like, all right, but I mean, maybe it's severe, maybe something happened. And the notes are incredibly vague, but they seem to indicate that this uh, particular person was uh, warm on a summer day and decided to put their feet outside their window with an open window. Uh, and what happened was... <laughs> A bird came no. thinking that their pinky toe was <laughs> something else and went and tried to like peck it like a, what's it called? swoop yeah. down like a fucking eagle and then peck <laughs> it out thinking it's going to be I don't know what the fuck. Uh, so yeah, this poor person had their uh, pinky toe bit. Uh, and then they came to the. Like you can't relax and... anywhere anymore. Like what the fuck? Yeah. Like you hold can't on, even on, push on. your fucking feet outside of the fucking window. A fucking piece of shit bird's gonna come eat it. Like, like, like what am I supposed? Wanna... Like new fear unlocked. Thank you very much. Like everything I mean, is. Like yeah. the other day, I'm watching but... randomly TikTok, mm. and this one like horrible. Mm. I'm not even gonna make fun of it. And he's like, today uh, they uh, finally sentenced the the homeless man who uh, cut me up into pieces with the two katana swords mm. I'm like mm. am i supposed to like when i'm walking down the street expect a guy to pull out katanas now like is this supposed to be something i'm ready for oh. okay and like now the bird what the fuck man i'm pissed look do, do you want to know the best part about it yeah uh this poor person decided to show up uh to the emergency ward only to wait for several hours and then be seen by a doctor who would promptly tell them go home <laughs> there's oh. nothing we're gonna do for you <laughs> we don't give three shits about your pinky toe <laughs> <laughs> oh. basically like that's as polite of a way as they could have uh, you know uh in the notes it basically said like oh yeah the patient was uh, promptly sent home i'm like all right very interesting i'm glad i'm glad that this is the uh the state of healthcare. So, uh, was uh, what mm. kind of bird are we talking? Was it like a seagull? It, was it a, a, I, a I, raptor I, of some kind? Did the toe, I, I, was the toe I, I, removed? No, I, the the person's toe was fully intact. It was just chomped a little it. bit. It no, okay. Yeah, it was chomped up. <laughs> the person came in because the uh, I mean, they, I guess they bled a little. Uh, bled, fuck me, I can't speak. Bled a little, um, uh -huh. but otherwise. Um, Actually, this is another stupid side tangent. I'm going to be a little bit all over the place today. Have you guys noticed? Actually, you got Nick. You got Nick. Um, could you please tell me the season between uh, autumn and spring? Between autumn and spring, it's uh, yeah. winter. Exactly right. Uh, JT, could you please yeah. tell me? Winter. Okay, Why? you say it's winter. I've heard so many Americans say winter. Not oh, winter. yeah. It depends on where you are in the States. Like, I lived in Connecticut, right. and a particular thing, that, like a vocal thing that people would do there, was um, they'd, like, swallow teas. Like, kitten instead of kitten mm. or mitten yeah. it drove me crazy i don't know why they do it um mm. yeah i don't know but yeah that's it depends on where you are yeah. uh, what here about, in texas you got winter you do have some people if it's if it's particularly southern they will mm. say winter what about the uh, what's it called online connectivity the service what it, what is it called oh internet yeah i say internet yeah uh -huh. you say internet i say uh -huh. internet yeah right? internet um and this is i think the way that people can always tell I'm not actually American. Because every single time I've been abroad and I meet Americans, they never say, oh, you're American. They ask, have you lived in the States? Yeah. I'm like, no, I've never been to the States. Uh, but their assumption is always that I'm not American. Um, mm. Maybe it's these little things that give it away. Who, go who knows? Uh, but anyways, back to the little pinky. Uh, the poor woman <laughs> was sent home, and then she came in with something much more serious. Uh, so uh, the <laughs> poor lady, she can't catch a break. Uh, I was Dina fairly certain that you were going to say she died. 
<laughs> no, no, not that bad, not that bad. But yeah, uh, speaking of though, um, what's it called? Somebody catching a break. That is me, because I demolished several patient sandwiches uh, on my night shift yesterday, and I will never, I will shout it on the rooftops. This is <laughs> my birthright: is to go <laughs> and raid the patient fridges. I don't give a fuck. Really. <laughs> These poor people, they're in there, they're like, oh, they're suffering, and they're like, oh, at least I can look forward to a, a sandwich lovingly made by my spouse to, to, to get no, me through no, this. No, it could be worse. No, no, it could no, be no, worse. No, no. He goes and raids. If the patient dies, he's immediately, hey, nurse, which rooms like uh, are with the dead ones? So, like three, four, and seven. Ah, okay. The, did you empty the fridges yet? No, no, no. I'm waiting for you, Hakim. Go. <laughs> There's okay. ham in Hold three. On. But uh, don't, don't even go to the dead lady in seven. She was a vegan <laughs> oh, exactly right my god no i was gonna say just to absolve myself no no there is like we provide sandwiches in, in oh, like the okay. All right. store. it's not the people it's not their families who make sandwiches and i go and i eat it's okay good like, that's, that's a, a little bit more acceptable I, <laughs> I was like this oh guy's god. fucked up like you know when uh, in certain <laughs> cultures when you know you go to uh, someone's grave uh, whenever the anniversary mm. is of their passing and you bring some food you eat there and then you leave some food for them you know for them to eat mm. in the in the next world and so on and there's always you know the second you leave like a shit ton of cats and dogs that like live on the mm. on the graveyard that eat that food basically survive off of it. I just imagine Hakim like <laughs> sneaking in a graveyard, being like, ah, Scavenging. sandwiches, rah, rah. Oh my god, <laughs> fucking demon, bro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking banana bread. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back to the deep program today's episode will be the finale of uh, our liberalism series uh, we started with the of course the first episode which was the foundations of liberalism the second one which was essentially the the concept of liberal of the liberal state we spoke about separation of powers parliamentarism private property capitalism all this nonsense uh and then the of course the third part was more of a meme one historical liberalism their hypocrisy how they are basically all slave owners or justified slavery uh amongst other you know fun things that liberals like to justify uh, and now we're entering into the um I guess, theoretical kernel of the series, as well as the, like, socialist result, let's say. Uh, as always, I recommend Lacerdo's excellent work, Liberalism and Counter History. I recommend that you read Lenin's uh, State and the Revolution. Uh, and, of course, uh, relevant to today's episode, at least, uh, Mao's Combat Liberalism, which is not directly related to this kind of uh, discussion, but uh, it's still a great thing that you should read. Uh, a quick recap uh, of the general situation of liberalism or the general background of liberalism. The, there were certain material conditions uh, of local European urban center class struggle, which gave rise to the philosophical presuppositions of liberal, liberalism, because there, these uh, material changes uh, were in the interests of a newly developing class at the time, which was the bourgeoisie, the, ruling, the current ruling class, the people who owned the means of production. Uh, in a nutshell, liberalism tries to uh, embody a few uh, concepts, one of them being uh, pro-individual liberty, but not the kind of liberty you're thinking of, uh, anti-concentration of power or pro-plurality, but not in the way you're thinking of, uh, constitutionalism, of course, in, in, through enshrining capital into the constitution, into law, so you can't uh, combat or resist capital. Pro-minority uh, pro rights, but not, again, not in the way you're thinking of, sanctification of private property, and of course, capitalism. We can start with a very, very simple, uh, I guess, outline of the state uh, and the concept of liberalism within the state, and then we can uh, delve a bit deeper. Uh, private property uh, and rule of capital, as you've been made aware in the previous episodes, are enshrined into the very nature of the bourgeois state. Uh, what is the bourgeois state? It is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. What does this mean? It means that uh, there is a certain ruling class, the owning class, the people who own the means of production, capitalists, who exercise a dictatorship over all state function to their benefit or in their interests. Now, they don't do this on an individual basis, not one or two capitalists. It's the capitalist class as a whole. They can, be, they can have differences between them, but in general, uh, the purpose of the bourgeois state and the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie is to serve the general interests of the current ruling class. That's why, for example, the vast majority of democratically uh, popular concepts within the United States, for example, like healthcare, reduced military spending, increased taxes on the wealthy, or other such similar concepts around the world, are never really adopted despite them being the democratic will of the people. People understand this intuitively, 
but when you look into the functioning of the modern state, uh, these ideas are mystified. Uh, they they kind of covered up on exactly the inner functioning, if in, inner functionings. Uh, they're mystified through legalistic and strange language that you don't really encounter outside of these uh, fields. Um, they're usually parsed by particular quote unquote specialists. All of this is just barriers to to uh, I guess obfuscate the the the, the ideology behind the the liberal state or the liberal bourgeois state. We can discuss specifically, though, uh, what those functionings are and what the purpose of the state is, and then we can kind of get into more details. Uh, so as mentioned, of course, the, the, the this mystification uh, of, like, you know, constitutional power, uh, functioning power within a capitalist state, etc. In general, how everything works, you don't really have a direct idea. It's difficult to get direct answers. Sometimes, if you've ever had the displeasure, for example, of interacting with any quote-unquote aide or official, uh, of some politician, you'd realize that they don't really know either. <laughs> and it's kind of funny to, to uh, experience that. I think in the US, this is a lot more um, direct, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you probably live in the Washington DC area. I remember we had a uh, uh, Lady is the heart uh, on uh, as a guest and she spoke about her experiences uh, there and she kind of led into this a little bit as well, um, uh, where uh, the functioning uh, even at the highest level of government within a supposedly liberal, you know, Republican, Democratic uh, state, uh, we're generally uh, fairly confused to the people who are supposed to be administrating everything. Moving on, there, there's the other side of this ideological coin, which is the fact that, or the idea that uh, parliamentary democracy, rule of law, you know, like rule of law in capital letters, I mean, uh, quote-unquote rule of law, uh, they, these are treated as immutable ideas woven into the fabric of the universe. This is something that just is, this is how things are supposed to be, this is the natural order of things, and when a country enters any sort of crisis, particularly uh, in liberal, constitutional, bourgeois states, these crises kind of dispel this, the, the, the myth or the aura of mystery and power of the bourgeois state. How exactly does it do this? When things work as usual, of course, the, the courts are supposedly blind and the police protect everybody. And, you know, laws exist to uh, make sure that even people of severely um, different uh, class backgrounds and wealth and everything else would be met uh, as equals before the law, etc., etc. This is a myth. But in reality, we see that uh, the state at the end of the day is a weapon of a ruling class be it, for example, uh, the capitalist class or proletarian class, whatever class it may be. In the current state of affairs, it's we live under the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, so the state is a weapon of the ruling class, bourgeois class, to be used in the class struggle against the interests of the working class, against regular interests of regular working people. What this means, for example, is on the flip side, under socialism, the ruling class is the proletariat, the working class. And then as a result, the, sta the state is used to uh, suppress or um, used to limit the, the power of those who used to be or still currently members of the bourgeoisie, members of the capitalist class, uh, if they were to even continuously exist uh, at that point. The general point I'm trying to kind of connect uh, in your head is there exists a certain ideology that clouds the functioning of uh, these constitutional liberal bourgeois republics. And this myth is usually only broken, this understanding that this is just how things are supposed to be, and it's natural like this. This is only broken when the ruling class is threatened, and then they'll have to resort to the quote-unquote old-timey perception of a state, which is still the current perception of the state, as armed bodies of men uh, with a monopoly on, of the use of violence in order to maintain quote-unquote rule of law, which is in, again, as mentioned, uh, according to the constitution and everything else that exists, in the interests of the bourgeoisie. When they first appeared, constitutional laws, uh, they were created to kind of give you the idea that they limit or regulate the power of the state, uh, but you still can't divorce them from the, the material origins that they came out of. Uh, I know that I'm sorry for this kind of lectury at this point, but I just need to get the, the, this, this final point out. Uh, constitutional laws, when they first arose, were a victory of bourgeois revolutions against the, the old feudal order in Europe, because then it allowed for the first time the capitalist class to reach a point of absolute supremacy, political supremacy, in a state institution. Afterwards, this idea was exported throughout the world, of course, throughout Europe at first, and then throughout the world with uh, colonialism, imperialism, and whatnot, uh, and through just simple dissemination of ideas, because class struggle doesn't just, you know, start and begin in Europe, uh, it happens all over the world. I'll interlude with uh, with uh, my usual snake eating its own ass. It's uh, con see. constitutional democracies, as they're called, have the this 
to me at least, incredibly fascinating approach to uh, pitching the moment when a so-called uh, rights-based society chooses to uh, relinquish all perception of rights in order to maintain uh, the status quo. Uh, that moment, be it when you know they send armed bodies of men out on the streets to break your legs because you don't agree with, for example, what is happening in France with uh, with pension reforms, or when they uh, when they. Uh, uh, change the particular government in elected government in question because it no longer uh, agrees with uh, supranational interests that might be coming from uh, places closer to the imperial core or the imperial core itself blah 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 without uh, dulling it too long it's a, whenever whenever they pitch to us that they need to beat the shit out of us on the street whenever they use terms like you know establishing order whenever they're mm. uh, they're uh, you know rights to uh, uh, gathering, rights to free speech, uh, uh, rights to uh, referenda, et cetera, et cetera. Whenever those are removed uh, from the conversation, usually the argument of why we're removing it from the conversation is so that we can have those in the future. You know, you cannot just let the unruly masses uh, burn the streets and, you know, protest uh, some one or the other particular thing that usually uh, wounds the working class even more than uh, than the current status quo because then we will lose what that people are not going to be able to beat the shit out of us on the street it's 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 mm -hmm. it you it it uh, it basically tells you uh, the reason you know like bad parenting the reason i'm hitting you with the stick right now is uh, so that you learn how to behave so that i don't have to hit you with the stick again but it's not removing the stick Yes, in, in in constitutional democracies they say no. We you know we are democracies and we are liberal societies and so on because we do not use these quote unquote authoritarian policies. But and the only time when they do use the authoritarian policies quote unquote they say that they are using it so that they can keep the actual non authoritarian liberal order there. And that always, as Hakim beautifully put, happens when, you know, the, the, the common uh, current ruling class uh, that operates, the, for whom the state operates, is uh, put into question or put into, put into crisis. But, it, but people ab absolutely eat that up. You know, everyday NPC Joes that, you know, have uh, less class consciousness than they have inches on their dicks. Uh, when they see, you know, cops beating the shit out of some young motherfuckers out there wearing masks, etc., Etc. They 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 literally explain it the way to themselves that this is absolutely necessary. When they see cops, you know, whacking certain particular minorities, even when they're not uh, racist, they will say, you know, unfortunately, that is the price we have to uh, pay in order to have a police force. In this case, a bourgeois police force. It is, you know, the the the, the fucked up aspects of everything that in no way follows the actual presupposition of uh, what we all accept as liberal society happening on, a, on, a, on an everyday basis is used to explain away why it needs to happen. And it's, 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 it's absolutely insane. It's like Stockholm Syndrome on, uh, uh, on steroids for me, but mm. you just you know, mm. so widely ideologically accepted that it's, that it's not even seen as, seen as weird. You know, like uh, you have a bunch of dudes now not even commenting at all on, for example, the Hong Kong protest, you have cops coming out fighting with these other guys that uh, have a different idea of how they want shit to be run, and uh, there, there's a skirmish on the street. Immediately, every Western liberal democracy calls that what, you know? crackdown on uh, freedom of speech, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing happens, I know this is a cliche, but uh, still relevant to what we're talking about here. Uh, same thing happens, for example, on the streets of Paris. We say, you know, it's necessary for people to start calming down because this is not how we do things in liberal democracies. But how do we make people calm down? By sending fucking rabid dogs on them to uh, to break mm. their uh, break their fucking faces. And it's, 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 it's just, it's like, Somebody promising you that, oh man, like it's an abusive relationship, literally, that that the everyday mm -hmm, citizens yeah, have yeah. with the the liberal con the constitutional democratic. Uh, I wouldn't even call it society enterprise. You know, uh, the, honey, I'm not gonna beat you next time. I'm not gonna beat you next time. Then beats the shit, pushes you down the stairs. Honey, I'm not gonna do it again. Then it gets worse. Then it gets worse. Then it gets worse. The more the bourgeois loses fucking control over. Uh, 
their wife in this case us being the wife Mm -hmm. i think the parent analogy you made was really good because it's the it's the type of thing where you know the parent will will hit the kid and say you know i I don't want to have to do this and i think that is Mm -hmm. very much the case with these liberal democracies as well because they don't really want to have to resort to this this violence and stuff because it makes them look bad and it kind of takes the mask off for a second where they would Mm -hmm. much rather just to have docile subjects continue uh, to to play by the rules or you know by their rules Mm -hmm. Um, but it's always sold as you know this is a this is an extreme circumstance we don't like to do this um, Mm -hmm. but we are going to deploy (laughs) effectively Mm -hmm. an invading army into your streets um, highly Mm -hmm. militarized police force all that stuff so yeah. It's the type we, don't of thing things that to, we don't want things to get worse, and then they send a tank. How worse than that? Like, right, exactly. what mm. worse than that? Everybody a tank needs to calm my... down. <laughs> yeah. mm. No, exactly right. Uh, and I think uh, this leads into um, a, uh, I guess, the very core. We always link it back to capitalism, right? Um, and the basis of all <laughs> these actions. Yeah, exactly. Capitalism bad. Uh, the basis of all these actions are in constitutional laws that inherently flow both in content and in form directly from a system based on commodity production. So on, on capitalism, uh, we're going to get into this specifically, uh, or I want to like develop this point uh, in just a bit. But before that, I want to say uh, build on the the idea of the state. You know, well, like the the nature of the liberal state or the quote unquote democratic republic. Uh, and why it is kind of the the perfect seat for capitalism, why it's, uh, uh, in essence, the pinnacle of what capitalism can, can, capitalism can occupy and then use for its own uh, purposes. Uh, if you'll indulge me with, a, with an Engels quote, um, this is from his kind of outdated now, uh, Origins of the Family, uh, Private Property in the State. Uh, he said, but in order that these antagonisms, uh, classes with conflicting interests, might not consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle, it became necessary to have a power seemingly standing above society that would alleviate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of so-called order. And this power, arisen out of society but placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it, is the state. This point is very, very crucial uh, and one of the reasons why Engels was such an amazing mind. Um, the idea that uh, the state, which is inherently a tool of, gla- of class domination, can pretend to be objective and stand above everybody else, to stand as a uh, completely neutral, uh, blind, uh, mediating party, uh, is one of the kind of victories of historical uh, forms of the state, not only specifically under capitalism. If we move on to Lenin, or to paraphrase Lenin a little bit, uh, the mechanisms by which the state maintains order, or the quote-unquote rule of order, uh, is through what uh, Lenin termed the armed bodies of men, as I mentioned earlier. These are things like the courts, prisons, police, the army, state power, including liberal state power, democratic quote-unquote state power within bourgeois society, doesn't stand neutral above society, but it is, again, a weapon in the hands of the class that is able to maintain an armed body of men. So this is fundamentally a tool of the owning class to use against the non-owning class. Under liberalism specifically, this takes a more interesting form because each capitalist under liberalism, each capitalist submits, uh, as everyone else, even people who don't own a capital, to the so-called rule of law of the state and the power of the state, um, supposedly. Uh, this is, quote-unquote, on paper, quote-unquote, how they want to, or not, uh, like, supposedly how they want to portray it to you, that there's this objectivity. The objectivity that they push on you is through the supposed uh, limits that states, monostates have, uh, limits placed on their powers, meaning separation of different parts of the, the state, the legislative, executive, and judiciary, which we kind of touched on in the previous uh, episode on Liberalism Part 3. Uh, this is a bullshit point, basically, but uh, refer to that if you want to. Uh, other examples include human rights treaties and other legal and political mechanisms, uh, which basically, in theory, make it so that uh, rights are enforceable by any individual acting through the courts. So, for example, it could be, you know, Jeff Bezos or JT, basically, uh, who can uh, go before a court within the U.S. acting as individuals and both of their rights will be enforceable on an equal level uh, playing field in which justice would be, quote-unquote, blind as to uh, how they would go about ruling. This kind of penetrates into society in general, but specifically the uh, specialists of bourgeois society, politicians and lawyers, uh, etc. Uh, they view this as uh, a guarantee of the independence and neutrality of the state. Um, I hope that people, the people listening right now understand my point that it's highly ideological. There, this mystification and this presentation is entirely 
uh, or this purpose entirely is to show that despite the fact that it is a state, uh, the state institution is in the power of the hands of a certain class in order to dominate and in order to be used for their own interests, this is kind of obfuscated and instead you get this kind of whiteout where they write over it, oh yeah, no, independent, where uh, everybody is equal before the law and uh, we serve everybody's uh, interests neutrally, you know, above society. If we look into the history of this ideology at play, uh, again, I'll refer to, to Engels if, if uh, you don't mind. Engels explained in, in uh, ancient Greek society, Athenian democracy, all right, there was a guy named Solon of Athens. Um, he established a new constitution uh, in 594 BC, which basically um, avoided huge debts that used to be on lower classes, uh, gave uh, people who are in lower classes uh, protections against the ruling class within Athenian society. It prevented the lower classes from being sold into slavery, etc. Um, basically, it was a constitution that was written after a period of quote-unquote naked class domination through the state. Prior to this uh, constitution that Solon of Athens wrote up, people could be like regular lower class people, not slaves, regular lower class people could be sold into, slave, into slavery at will. They uh, could be um, burdened with insurmountable debts. Um, this sounds like the United States, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, that's just kind of tongue in cheek. But yeah, um, my, my point being here is though, um, what Solon's constitutional arrangement, this new new constitution that are brought in, it reigned in the power of the ruling class and subjected it to some sort of uh, quote, like discipline uh, within the state. Uh, but it didn't challenge the fundamental class structure of that society. That's kind of the point that Engels is trying to make. Uh, despite the fact that there was a semblance of protections that was given, the very nature and uh, of, of class structure and the class interests that were being served before the constitution and afterwards were exactly the same. Engels described this change as a, a quote-unquote political revolution, whereby there was a process or processes uh, which involved a transition from the state as a quote-unquote naked weapon of class rule to a constitutional state. This is uh, the, the mystification. In this particular example, if you were to expand it way more across a thousand other uh, levels, you'd get the modern liberal state. With all that being said, to, to, to summarize just these a few points, uh, constitutions are basically a conquest, they are the major conquest of bourgeois revolutions against the old feudal order. Uh, they are a product of class struggle, as are most things, which forced concessions from the old feudal uh, order, established order, toward um, the new uh, emerging capitalist class. This doesn't mean, though, that they avoided compromise or any sort of accommodation between different wings of the ruling class, uh, between the old order, like aristocrats and other feudal lords, and the new uh, ruling class, meaning capitalists. This you can see fairly clearly in modern constitutions, that they are a product of revolutionary action, counter-revolution, compromise, debate. There is a quote-unquote dialectical relationship in the formation of modern constitutions, to use a tired, a tired Marxian, Marxist jargon trope. Uh, but back to, to, back to the core point. Engels, he explained that this, uh, the, Solon's political revolution, the, 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 the constitution of Athens, um, it didn't fundamentally change the class structure of Athenian society. It remained a slave society, but with a different state structure. In contrast, bourgeois revolutions were a more fundamental change to society because they specifically moved society from a feudal mode of production to a capitalist mode of production. Despite the fact that class dynamics still remain, there's still a minority ruling over a majority based on economic privilege. Nonetheless, this is kind of um, why the bourgeois revolutions were a step up uh, above uh, what came before, the socioeconomic shifts that came before. Uh, Marx, he says in the in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, he says, all previous revolutions perfected the state machine instead of smashing it. And this is, uh, the pinnacle of this formation is the modern, quote unquote, democratic republic. It's the most refined and perfected tool for the ruling class. Lenin has very long uh, discussions about this in State and the Revolution. Uh, at every interval, the modern, quote unquote, democratic republic is tied to capitalist interests. Uh, just to give a few examples, um, of course, in the United States, this is very common, but this is common all the world over, really. Uh, the revolving door between business and government uh, like institutions, which ensures that ministers and civil servants can move easily between government regulators and the companies and industries they're supposed to be regulating. Uh, big business lobbying and lobbyists, which use threats, uh, for example, capital flight, uh, which is a very common thing across Europe. Whenever any talk of any um, uh, raising of uh, uh, capital gains tax or income tax or things to that effect, 
uh, are brought up, uh, the first thing that you start seeing in newspapers is the threat of the hyper wealthy in that country uh, of them moving um, and and uh, taking like you know the their the capital they have invested in said country out of it. So this is this is capital flight. This is what they threaten with. Otherwise, there are many, uh, for example, for ways of bribing uh, in order to force governments to act in the interest of the bourgeoisie. Um, there's market speculation, direct market speculation, market manipulation, intervention. This has been extensively documented. We've even spoken about it in uh, earlier episodes. Uh, the mobilization of profits for specifically political gains uh, through supporting individual uh, actors within the political sphere. Courts, prisons, police, and army, they're usually used, and not only usually, but by majority used, to defend the uh, the rights of private, private property. They, they're usually mobilized to defend private property, particularly of the wealthiest. Meanwhile, rights of uh, the rights of poor people to housing and food and whatnot are ignored relatively. Not only this, usually they're um, directly uh, punished because the, the concept or the sanctity of private property stands above for example, a homeless person trying to, you know, stay somewhere where they get some cover from the rain or something, uh, or if somebody were to go dumpster diving behind a grocery store and get some food, as happens in the U.S. and across the world. All of this kind of gives you a political scaffold of how the state is, what, uh, how it uh, formed, uh, the nature uh, and dynamics of uh, the state in regards to ideology and how, you know, they mystify exactly what they're supposed to be doing despite the fact that when you really look behind the curtain you see that's a very simple dressing a pleasant dressing for uh, a much more um, ordinary let's say that's a better word to use uh, purpose uh, but let's talk about specifically the capitalist basis again because i mentioned that as as Lenin which is difficult because uh, capitalism is not based no, oh, sorry that was, <laughs> exactly. I, i'm 12 years old <laughs> apologies <laughs> no it's perfectly fine it's perfectly fine uh, as Lenin said, the uh, democratic, modern democratic republic is the best shell for capitalism. Why is that the case? Okay, um, let's bring it back to very simple discussions, the market, okay? Uh, productions of goods for the market, as described by Marx, as this is, this is comedy, uh, commodity production. Uh, this is the dominant form of production and the foundation of the economy under capitalism. Production of goods for the market. The commodity, once it's produced, can only realize its value. It, it can only, you know... Uh, be mobilized within the market when it's exchanged on the market. Uh, commodities can't exchange themselves, obviously. So they need somebody to perform this act of exchange, something to f uh, perform the act of exchange and so that the, basically the circuit of capital moves. Uh, what this means, in other words, is that these commodities require a legal owner in order to be mobilized on the market. Uh, this means that the concept of legal rights, of individual ownership, is an inherent part of commodity production. This is basically something that existed, you know, like so-so uh, in previous socioeconomic systems. The reason that was only so-so because the fundamental nature of production in previous socioeconomic systems was not the production of goods for the market as the dominant form of production under those former socioeconomic systems. Under feudalism, production of goods for the market wasn't the, it wasn't the main thing. Under slave society, it wasn't the main thing. Under quote-unquote primitive communism or, you know, uh, hunter-gatherer society, it wasn't the main thing. Only under capitalism did it become the dominant form of production uh, and, and foundation of, of an economy. Capitalism is unique in the form that it requires legal property rights in order for commodity, commodities to be mobilized on the market. Uh, so yeah, at the LDR, the concept of legal uh, rights of this individual ownership uh, of commodities is an inherent part of commodity production. Then when you move on to individuals within a market system, within capitalism, buyers and sellers exist on the market, obviously, right? Commodities can't uh, exchange themselves. You need to have people who want commodities and people who are selling commodities. Uh, the market determines it's the market itself determines the exchange value so the price of commodities being traded uh, according to you know uh, supply and demand the one of course we're not going to get into conversations of value and other kind of you know socially necessary labor time yes 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 all of this is valid but i'm trying to keep it simple for the political point here i'm not trying to make an economic one right now uh, the market itself it determines the exchange value of commodities being traded uh, so this is something that the buyer and seller can't play individual roles in. The buyer can't come and be like, hey, you know what? I determined that my goods are going to be this much and you're going to have to pay for it. Like you're going to have to pay this price. Uh, and likewise, the seller can't come and be like, you know what? No, I think I'm going to pay way under what you're, what you're asking for. Um, when you have a generalized market, there's a, an equilibrium of prices for a particular good. That's why you can't go into any dealership anywhere uh, and try to pay uh, fucking $20 for a car. 
nobody's you know there's a certain equilibrium price uh, based on a thousand factors and that's a much more uh, nuanced economic point maybe we'll go over it uh, in another episode sometime in the future but yeah as I was mentioning buyer and seller they meet in the marketplace right the market is what determines the the uh, exchange value of the commodities being traded the buyer and, and seller cannot play individual roles they can't influence the prices it's something the market influences um, it's influenced by economy manufacture process of manufacture social necessary labor time amongst other things what this means essentially is that the buyer and seller while at the marketplace must be stripped of all individuality that could disrupt the process of determining the exchange value of their commodities this is different from previous socioeconomic systems because for example under feudalism combat strength could or like or aristocratic privilege could play a very big role in what the prices of your goods or somebody else's goods were if there's an invading army coming in uh, and uh, they basically uh, under threat of force are making you way undersell um, your funk your, your exactly your funko pop <laughs> exactly right you just can't have to abide by that uh likewise aristocratic privilege certain aristocrats would be like mm, no because i am the lord of this land and whatnot you're gonna you're gonna sell this stuff to me uh for like 20 percent of what you're supposed to uh, out of respect for you know my aristocratic lineage amongst other examples uh this was this was way more common in previous socioeconomic systems under capitalism this basically doesn't exist on the large-scale market like global and international markets this doesn't exist if you go to a, a farmer's market there's a different case those are much more local examples uh, I'm talking about capitalism a capitalism as a world system you can't as, as I mentioned the buyer and seller uh, while at the marketplace they must be stripped of all their individuality that could disrupt this process of determining exchange value of these commodities uh, what this means uh, in summary is that the buyer and sell seller have to be recognized as entirely equal to one another even if they aren't even if one of them is a king and one of them is like you know uh, a step above homelessness or one of them is a high energy entrepreneur CEO and one of them is a student or whatever it may be these two people when they meet at the marketplace as a buyer and seller they are recognized as entirely equal to one another this quality is the nature of the legal relationship between individuals and a system of commodity exchange what does this mean because this, this can I, sound a little bit complicated what this means essentially is that equality before the law is essential to the smooth running of commodity exchange and the capitalist system as a whole this is something that didn't exist in previous socioeconomic systems. This is something kind of exclusive to capitalism as it stands. In order for individuals to confront each other in an open marketplace as legal owners of commodities with equal rights, there has to be certain guarantees in place which can, you know, regarding the safety and security of both individuals and the commodities. So what this means is that nobody can be threatened in a marketplace to um, uh, reduce their price of their commodities. Nobody can have the commodities legally, like, you know, damaged so that they, the, the worth of them would be less so that they'd be sold at a lower price. And I'm reiterating a lot in the, in the again, Marxian fashion just to, just to get the point across Absolutely. basically what what you're saying correct me if i'm wrong is uh that while the rules were very flexible about pretty much everything else when it comes to yeah. the market operating properly and uh, mm. the game rules of the market being defined as such uh, is the only thing that can never be uh fucked with exactly right yeah and this th these game rules are inherently enshrined in the constitution are protected by the state which pretends to be above all of society as a neutral mediator between completely legally equal partners oh, and no, while parties, we can me, sometimes uh, lift and while we can sometimes lift specific uh, constitutional legislation and rule uh, during times of quote-unquote crisis etc etc very rarely borderline i would argue never do we lift the rules mm. on how the market operates yes exactly right yeah, yeah exactly Be hence we see russia this, selling yeah. gas to uh, nato countries for example you know even <laughs> they are, exactly right yeah yeah B -b perfect example no exactly right uh, and that's why the, these the what's called the safety and security of both individuals and commodities is of, is of such high importance without these guarantees of rights to personal safety and property ownership exchange couldn't take place and then commodity production which is the kernel of capitalism would grind to a halt and as a result then you wouldn't be able to have capitalism so what this means is that the power that guarantees security for those capitalists engaging in commodity product uh, uh, engaging in commodity exchange excuse me must be a quote-unquote public power one that is quote-unquote independent of any one particular capital capitalists which is again different than previous eras before you could have one aristocratic clique that kind of controlled uh, the vast majority of market you know relations and as a result could influence everything to their benefit under capitalism this doesn't exist you need to have a quote-unquote public independent power which is separate from any one particular capitalist but nevertheless is in the service of the capitalist class as a whole 
um, and this is the, the role of the bourgeois state and its function, uh, which is to defend the system of commodity exchange, which that which means, in a deeper point, to defend capitalism. At the very lowest, at the kernel, the cell of capitalism, to defend it. To, I guess, beat a dead horse at this point, uh, a set of rules, in this case, would need to be, are required to be, guarantee the independence of the state from any one individual capitalist or group of capitalists. So things like in the previous uh, systems where a group of aristocrats can kind of dominate, so this doesn't happen. To guarantee um, two things. Number one, loyalty to the capitalist system as a whole. And number two, to maintain this kind of... Um, equality between capitalists so that uh, whenever you go into the market you will be able to maintain the standard functioning of commodity production these rules that kind of enshrine these guarantees and independence and neutrality blah, blah blah all these flowery words these are constitutional laws i'll quote lenin on this another reason why the omnipotence of wealth is more certain in a democratic republic is that it does not depend on defects in the political machinery or on the faulty political shell of capitalism a democratic republic is the best possible political shell for capitalism and therefore once capital has gained possession of this very best shell it establishes its power so securely so firmly that no change of persons institutions or parties in the bourgeois democratic republic can shake it Essentially, what Lenin is trying to tell you is no matter what, you'll have to play by the capitalist rules built into the quote-unquote democratic republic via constitutions, laws, the nature and functioning of such a state. You won't be able to reform your way out of capitalism as well. This is a deeper point that Lenin is trying to make here is secondarily. But with every, like everything else, and I think this is going to tie it up before we enter into the discussion of what socialism would look like or at least uh, counter to, to, to everything I presented. Um, all these things I've stated, they have limits, okay? When the power of... Uh, the capitalist class or the ruling class is threatened, they basically, by majority, resort to unconstitutional means to keep themselves in power. Uh, the most unconstitutional mean, quote-unquote, that they resort, resort to is fascism. Uh, this is what happened in, in Italy and in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, likewise, in times of crisis, when the interests of one country's national bourgeoisie can't be uh, guaranteed uh, through rule of law, quote-unquote, then usually wars can break out as a result to establish a new order, a new balance sheet, basically. Uh, and this is what happened in the First and Second World Wars. There are several books written uh, on uh, class analysis, basically, of, of uh, the World Wars, both First and Second. But my mind is blank. Excuse me, I worked a night shift. <laughs> so you'll, you'll have to do that research yourself. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the next one I'll, I'll remember uh, the titles. Regardless, uh, imperialism, uh, as a separate discussion, this never respected rule of law or independence or neutrality. Uh, imperialism, like fascism, was a naked um, form of class domination and, and uh, an expression of the interests of the capitalist class, uh, despite their supposed liberal presuppositions. With all that said, fascism is the exception. As it currently stands, it's the exception. Usually you have a quote-unquote respectable democratic republic uh, that abides by the rules that they claim to, to uphold. Uh, the general rule of bourgeois democracy and constitutionalism overall remains. So to kind of like put a bow on all this, the point is that constitutional law and a constitutional state are a phenomena peculiar to a capitalist mode of production. Although some of their characteristics, for example, um, as mentioned, you know, market relations with some semblance of equality in certain periods, but not generalized throughout the economy. Uh, that's just one example. Some of these characteristics may have been visible or could have been or are visible in older modes of production, like in ancient Athens or, I don't know, fucking Ottoman markets in the Balkans or something. Very interesting thing to read about. All these uh, older systems developed commodity exchange to a certain extent. But the concept of individual private ownership as a legal right is basically part of the foundations of capitalist society. And on top of this foundation, the constitutional scaffolding was constructed. It remolded old feudal aristocratic state structures into a new bourgeois one, which specifically makes the state uh, a tool of the new possessing class. I mean, the current ruling class, the capitalist class for the maintenance of their current interests, the oppression of the non-possessing class, which is basically the, the, the thing that they have in common with the old feudal and aristocratic states, the fact that it, the, states, the state's function is uh, to oppress the non-possessing class, uh, this remains the same. But the form is refined and perfected to specifically suit the, the needs of the bourgeoisie as it currently stands. 
I'm going to move on to, I guess, the final chapter of this uh, of this episode. For everybody bearing with us, thank you very much. Um, you actually have to learn to... something sometimes, you fucking <laughs> cunts, okay? <laughs> exactly right. Let us know if you like these kind of episodes. Uh, uh, next time, I'll be sure to bring more ball stories. But for now, we need to talk about <laughs> socialism. So socialism is when the government does stuff. <laughs> um, socialism, okay. Within the current constitutional system, uh, of liberal democracies, there could be opportunities that we could uh, use, uh, we could exploit the bourgeois legal system, basically, to win victories for workers. Uh, but you have to remember that the bourgeois state is basically hardwired, is built in against the interests of the working class. Marx and Engels, they explained, uh, when talking about the Paris Commune, what they learned from the Paris Commune, is that the task of a socialist revolution is to completely smash the bourgeois state not just build atop uh, what uh, their older institutions and make it so that the socialist revolution or this is what would make the socialist revolution different from all other previous revolutions uh, which basically defined uh, redefined uh, pre-existing state machinery, uh, reworked them into a new system. Also, likewise, socialism, like capitalism, would uh, be a marker for the transition from one socioeconomic system to another. The difference between socialism and capitalism, though, is that socialism doesn't only transition us to a new socioeconomic system, but it also creates an entirely new form of state apparatus, one that is different uh, than the former state functioning uh, under capitalism, which was built off of the, you know, uh, imprints of, of a feudalism, aristocratic order, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so on and so on, as uh, Zizek would say. <laughs> um, to use an example, because then once we start talking this way, it gets very abstract, so it's hard to imagine. Uh, I'll use the example of uh, the Russian Revolution. So in 1917, the first, I arguably first, proletarian state was established. And as you can expect, as with any state, the Soviet state was used as an instrument of class oppression. But unlike in previous states, the Soviet state was a weapon of the exploited masses, so the proletariat, to be used against the small handful of aristocrats and capitalists who want to oppress them. Uh, not the other way around. So it's it, instead of the capitalist cra- class using the state to um, oppress uh, the proletariat and use the state for their own interest, capitalist interests, under the Soviet system, the Soviet state was a uh, state of the proletariat, of the working class, which fought for the interests of the working class and suppressed the um, political capabilities and interests of the capitalist class and the former ruling order. In the first constitution of the, the RSFSR, the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, which then became the Soviet Union, or the Soviet constitution was basically adapted uh, from it, it very clearly and openly describes, number one, the class basis of the state. If you look at any bourgeois, democratic, liberal constitution, you will never see any discussion of the class interest. They'll always do this nonsense where they'll paint it as some sort of neutral, independent, above uh, like uh, above the society. We don't support any particular class. We're just kind of completely objective. This nonsense that we're used to hearing, which is absolute, well, nonsense. Um, the Soviet constitution was very clear, openly described the class basis of the state. Uh, it didn't use this strange, legalistic, um, difficult, impenetrable language, this weird decorative garbage. I don't know if any, if anybody listening has ever tried to read a constitution. Um, the American <laughs> constitution is a perfect fucking example. It's, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to say, I, they, they, like, I, the, you know, I don't think any Americans should get uh, offended by this. It is a garbage article. It's it's a it's yeah. it's a piece of shit. It's really badly written. I don't know. Maybe it's because they're like, oh, it's old timey English a little bit. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe it's because ugh, most Americans can read it at a fifth grade level, and then it seems like dude, I don't fucking know. Don't ask me. But uh, by the way, that's a condemnation of the American current educational system, not of Americans. Compared to other constitutions, the Soviet Constitution, as mentioned, clearly described class basis. Didn't use difficult language. It clearly explained the power. Uh, power in the country rested with uh, the workers and peasants of Russia and the Soviet Union at large. Uh, this uh, working power was uh, expressed through uh, workers' councils, which were called Soviets. Soviet means workers' council. Uh, and that specifically former ruling classes and those who were supporting reactionary groups like the, the white armies uh, in, the Russian, in the Russian Civil War would be denied access to political uh, power. You can compare this to the modern equivalent, for example, we use the U.S. always because it's just the biggest example. It doesn't have to be the U.S., but it's easier to grasp. The U.S. supposedly doesn't take away or doesn't deny access to political power to anybody. 
supposedly on paper it's, it says that no everybody has a chance to have their voice heard everybody can uh, legally participate etc etc uh, jt could you please remind me uh, I remember there's a little inkling of something of political, uh, not excuse me, not political prisoners. I misspoke. Uh, prisoners, regular prisoners, that just happen to be of a particular ethnicity, um, <laughs> not being able to vote by like huge margins because they have a felony on their name. That is correct. Yeah, in, in the United States, if you uh, if you are accused of a crime, if you go to prison, basically you have no rights. You're a non-person at that point, which makes it very convenient when we need uh, excess mm. labor to produce things like hand sanitizer during a pandemic or to go fight dangerous mm. fires. You just get you a, a truck full of convicts and take them out, mm. and nobody will know any better. Exactly right. So that's why, again, to to I reiterate so much of uh, I reiterate this point that we have so often on this podcast. It's Anything negative here about socialism is projection from capitalism. It's mm. things that capitalism does. It's done it for far longer, f- to a much larger extent, in much more horrific conditions. But for some reason, they, the, the pro- like the propaganda pushed kind of uh, attaches the label to socialism. I remember we did a dedicated episode on this at, at some point as well. Anyways, moving on. This particular uh, constitution of the Soviet uh, Union, the very first uh, constitution, gives an idea of what uh, a state and what constitutional law under socialism could look like, You know, at least at first. A proletarian state, a state within in the hands of the working class, is not just a reformed version of a capitalist state. It doesn't co-opt uh, the parliamentary structures uh, and rules of the bourgeoisie of the, former, of the former ruling class and then just use them for their own purposes. Instead, the working class develops and uses its own methods to, first of all, uh, assert political power, so they have direct access to political power, not even just representative, they could directly take part. Number two, they can uh, exercise control over society through, for example, Soviets, council, these councils of, of uh, elected workers and their delegates, uh, which extended through uh, throughout the entire Soviet Union from uh, trade unions to uh, consumer cooperatives to uh, local cultural um, gatherings. It, it's Think of any uh, reason to group together uh, a semi-large group of people for whatever reason and there would be some form of uh, council that would be formed where people would uh, elect delegates uh, which would be able to exercise direct uh, administrative uh, and political control over that community and then uh, at large over society through uh, like a tiered system of Soviets. Nowadays uh, we have even deeper ideas on how to make this much more horizontal uh, because everybody has a phone now. Uh, you can use uh, some interesting like forms of direct democracy uh, within segments that your part that concern you and your life exa- uh, specifically. Uh, Paul Cockshot has a, a thing he gave a, a few lectures in Hanoi a few years ago, specifically about this concept of a, a much more horizontal form uh, of de- um, democracy, voting on specifically both small scale and large scale uh, directives that you can take part in, you can give your opinions on, you can change basically through voting the uh, exact text and nuance, uh, as well as have a nuanced application, which for example, if you know, I'm not going to get too deep into it. Go and watch Hanoi, uh, the, the Hanoi lectures that um, Paul Cockshut gave on direct democracy. Uh, this is something that would be uh, part of a new socialist uh, system. I'm still talking about the Soviets here. Uh, but specifically within the Soviet Union, as mentioned, these councils of elected worker delegates could directly exercise uh, and the constitutional rules that govern a social state, they don't present themselves with false impartial, uh, impartiality. They don't bullshit you and tell you that they're neutral. That's not what exists. There's no abstract equality before the law under socialism. Under socialism, the uh, socialist state is a proletarian state and specifically will rule in the favor of the proletarian class for the working class because it is particularly interested uh, in the, well, in the interests, uh, I didn't know any other less clunky way of saying it. They're interested in the interests of the working class. A good example for this, for example, is if you have a manager in a, in a Soviet uh, enterprise, uh, as a regular worker, if your uh, manager is kind of a dick, uh, you can go and have in your local council, you can vote and then you can have him kicked out. You can actually bring a complaint against your boss. Think about any private enterprise you've ever worked on in your life. Could you ever bring a complaint against the boss and have anything come of it? Instead of, by the way, instead of either just like a, a them hand waving you away or somehow punishing you for daring to speak up, right? Uh, at best, at best in my life, I've seen a slap on the wrist for uh, a person of this kind uh, under capitalism. And to 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 uh, I guess finish finish off the the point on the the Soviet Constitution and just uh, bring it or bring it back into more abstract uh, notions. The way that this state or a social state will be set up is a way in which 
people will not be ignorant of the role of the state. They'll understand that the state exists as a, a, a tool of class oppression um, made and used for to maintain the interests of a particular class. A socialist constitution would look to defend the interests of the working class. It would openly uh, and simply describe the relations between classes and uh, would, of course, be subject towards uh, or to the editing uh, enfor enforcement uh, and uh, application uh, by regular people through their various forms of councils at every level of society. And this is not just abstract flowery language. This is something that existed, currently does exist, from Vietnam to Cuba to the for former Soviet Union and many other countries. To paraphrase Lenin, even the cook will be able to manage the affairs of the state. That's the point, right? The constitutional rules that would govern these state structures wouldn't be abstract laws, but they would be guidelines that would be shaped by the mass of people, either in all of society or in your particular niche, in your region or uh, grouping or what what may be, uh, to help them with the running of the administrative functions of the state, either in general uh, throughout all levels of the state or in your particular uh, niche, um, either if it's cultural or religious or manuf like you know industrial or what what may be. To to summarize, and this is my last paragraph, that I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. In the final analysis, and this is to use my favorite trope uh, of Marxist jargon, in the final analysis, <laughs> these, devel these developments hold the germ of the withering away of the state. Uh, the state of affairs of a transition between capitalism to socialism uh, has so far only been achieved by revolution, uh, and the current Republican setup, uh, according to all the info we just delivered, wouldn't ever allow itself to be reformed from capitalism into socialism. So what I'm trying to tell you is, number one, there is already a guide to action. Number two, we have to learn, read it, study it, learn from it, learn from its mistakes and its successes, uh, and develop new forms so that we can uh, make an even better attempt in the future and inshallah be successful uh, in more ways than the previous uh, attempts were successful. And of course, to remember that even within these ideas and, 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 and theory uh, is the core of the socialist approach or the, the thing that communists want, which is the eventual withering, of the, withering away of the state uh, and the formation of a much more horizontal society, which uses much more natural forms of enforcement of law rather than just simply armed bodies of men. As for the people who would be like, okay, maybe we can reform our way to the system or not, it's very, very clearly, or I won't say it that way. Instead, I'll let you know that historically, this has never happened. Social, we've never reformed our way into socialism. If you want to know why and know the what, how, and exactly what's going on with revolution, why does reform not work, etc., then you can check out our third ever episode uh, on this podcast, which was titled Reform or Revolution, for a much deeper dive into it. And finally, the Man, recommendations the that I gave. warm days. I remember those. Sorry. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> no, no, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, when I used to record underneath my bed, fuck me. Um, so read liberals. Now you're uh, in a big castle in uh, in uh, the US, mm. in your homeland. Exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly right. No, no. Do you know I I, I graduated from uh, below my 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 bed to above my bed uh, because I didn't care about the echo anymore. I was like, <laughs> my comfort is more important. But yeah, so read liberalism and counter history by Lacerdo. Read state in, uh, state in the revolution by um, Lenin, and of course read Mao's combat liberalism. Not because it's very related to all this, but just it makes you a better person. <laughs> I'd say um, yeah that's about it that's my that's my presentation thank you for Yay. coming to my TED talk oh lord that was uh, did you say well TikTok thank you for coming no, to my TikTok oh my <laughs> to, to, to my you... to my TED talk, TED talk that's a long TikTok <laughs> bucko that's a very yeah, long god damn uh, immediately all the Gen Zers were like okay the fact that you just said that means that everything he previously said makes no sense he's not informed at all uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that was brilliant thank you very much Hakim that was, that was very <laughs> you're good. very welcome loves uh anytime not uh, one thing to not forget though uh is of course uh our lovely lovely patrons who we couldn't do any of this without uh especially a big thank you to the habibi tier uh patrons who uh, we do our uh, monthly chats with uh if you're interested you can check out the tiers uh and then join us so you can uh, shoot the shit with us um and basically uh, if you want to bother me uh, as much as you want uh, <laughs> then uh, the, the habibi tier is basically the easiest one no, I'm, I'm teasing i love i love all the habibis uh, it's always a great time. Um, also, we have merch. Uh, if you guys uh, forgot, uh, the merch is pretty cool. Do check it out if you want some of it. And this has been the program. I'm Hakeem. I'm JT. And I'm Yugoth Mike. Reform these nuts! <laughs>